Okay, wonderful. My name is Linda Lucas. I'm an author, an illustrator, a mediocre programmer and a business school dropout. And there's like a well-known secret about Scandinavian people. We tend to be the world's most self-deprecating people ever. So the only identity that I actually feel proud about saying is that I'm a business school dropout. Everything else is kind of like in parentheses. But we'll get to all of those uh, during this talk. So I'm the person who organized the first ever Rail Skills. I'm not the co-founder of Rail Skills. I'm the first person who ever organized it back in 2009 in Helsinki, Finland, where I wanted to find a, a group of like-minded women and uh, men who were excited about learning uh, software development and never ever in a million years would I have imagined that I would end up being here in front of all of you, uh, that Rails Girls would end up happening in, in all over the world. It all started as a small practical thing for, for a group of friends in Helsinki. But because internet is amazing, uh, people started to tweet about rail skills and that over there is DHH in, in 2009 and I remember printing out that like tweet and putting it on my wall I'm like wow this is the biggest moment in my life DHH is tweeting about our event and it led to other things happening uh, for instance there was this guy called Jason Ong that my, some of you might know about and he, he called us and said that hey do you want to come to Singapore to organize a rail skills hello kitty Singapore thingy and me and Karri Saarin and we had never been to Singapore Singapore before and we had no idea if this thing would ever work beyond like the group of friends uh, that we had in Helsinki. We had no budget for anything, we had no plan but again we had never been to Singapore so we said like sure let's come over here and it is my amazing huge big pleasure to be back here after five years, four years uh, and my whole life has turned upside down since the last time I visited Singapore and so many other people's lives have changed and it's, it's such a pleasure to be in front of you. Uh, today, Railscoast has been in over 230 cities, everywhere from Amman to Australia, from Belo Horizonte to Berlin. It's all the local Ruby people, the grassroots level organizations that want to drive the change to see a more diverse Ruby community. And all of you coaches, you do amazing, important work by donating your time and your expertise to the beginners and giving people that magical first experience in building software. Thank you, thank you so much for doing that. Um, my journey, after starting RailSkills, uh, I went to New York to work for a local startup over there. I was the fifth employee at Code Academy and it grew to be 35 people. It was a little less than a million users and a little over 24 million users when I left. And you can imagine what happens in a company at that stage, like things break and people break and companies break. And it was one of the best, but also one of the most exhilarating experiences in my life. And I decided that I want to spend, spend, uh, spend time with my family and, and be close to them. I moved back to Helsinki. But you know, after New York, Helsinki is very small. There was not much happening over in Helsinki. And I had a lot of that startup zeal inside of me still, just like that, let's change the world for the better and so forth. But then I figured that maybe the most scalable change in the world doesn't happen inside of dating applications or, or I don't know, like food search applications or stuff like that that New York was building. Maybe the most scalable change in life happens when you're five years old that if we can change the way a five-year-old sees the world, we can change the entire world. And that's when I decided that I'll become a children's book author. And this was all a very noble and big uh, idea. There was only three little problems at this point. First of all, I wasn't an author. I had never written a book before. Uh, I wasn't an illustrator. I wasn't very good at drawing items. And then finally, I still considered myself to be a very mediocre programmer at this point. I definitely didn't have a PhD in programming. I had no idea about early childhood development or anything like that. But I figured that, okay, I'm going to go this through step by step. And drawing is in some ways mechanical repetition, that if you make a thousand circles, eventually the circles are going to get better. And I started my quest towards those thousand, thousand circles and the first drawing that I found from our archives is this. I'm four years old and I've made a Moomin house. And this is kind of the level where I start from. And uh, then I keep on drawing. These are like from four or five years ago, not very good yet, but I keep on drawing. And uh, the pictures are starting to get a little bit better and it helps tremendously that there's all these people around the world who send me back pictures of what they imagine Ruby looking like. There's pictures from Taiwan and from uh, Ukraine and, and all over the place. And I even get plush toys from Belo Horizonte and, and slowly the pictures start to get better also. 
there has to be more of a narrative of a little girl and lost gems and uh, a hidden father and, and all of the friends that she meets, like Linux the penguins who are really, really damn efficient but really, really hard to understand at times. And, and <laughs> there's um, Snow Leopard who's beautiful but doesn't want to play with the other kids. And, and there's androids who are really messy and, and hard to understand but super friendly. I want to like, be friends with everyone else. And, and foxes who are really idealistic and so on and so on. So I started to have an idea of like what kind of a narrative I would have and I figured that maybe I could also teach something through these stories, like the basics of computational thinking, like how to, how to take a problem and, and chop it into smaller pieces, but it was still a very much an idea until I did something that was probably like the best or the worst thing in my life. I put this project on Kickstarter. And this was January 2014 and I thought that I would have like the Ruby parents I had, like the moms and dads who, who had coached the Rails girls, like maybe they would support my project and, and this would be like a small side project and in the 30 days that the Kickstarter campaign was live, it ended up, ended up gathering $380,000 <laughs> worth of pre-orders and it's... It's not an applaud, it was like I was crying at this point because this was still an idea. This was not a full-fledged, beautiful product that the people were backing. And this is going to be a story about everything that happened after this. So, yeah, for the past year I've been a children's book uh, author, illustrator, without actually being those things. And I've almost been like Alice in Wonderland. I took the red pill and fell deep, deep, deep down inside of the computer and I'm trying to crawl my bag <laughs> way back up. And every one of you who thinks that ideas are born meaningful and resonant and beautiful, no, like ideas are born messy and sketchy and horrible. And then the only way to like figure out what you're doing is by just keep doing it, drawing those thousand circles one by one. This is the first version of what Ruby looked like. I had like an, as I said, like I, I was getting better at the drawing and I had an inkling of an idea what I wanted to do. This is the actual picture what, that was on Kickstarter about the workbook session. There's like book Sudoku, my first error message, Firefox is made, like some ideas, but very like I'm embarrassed that that still exists today. But what I've learned throughout this last year is that you can't go from here to here where you actually have 120 pages of a book, like a, like a tested curriculum, like a real thing without having the courage to put something like messy and horrible out there at first. You don't go from here to here unless you start from somewhere. And I'm not going to read this whole quote, but it's from Ira Glass, this wonderful Chicago uh, public radio guy who says that nobody tells this to people who are beginners. I wish, wish someone told me. All of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste. But there is this gap. For the first couple of years you make stuff, it's just not that good. It's trying to be good, it has potential, but it's not and so on and so on. And kind of this talk is about that gap, about having an idea and, and ha coming to reality with it and, and sort of trying to, yeah, crawl your way out of the computer in uh, literal and not so literal ways. So, last January my whole life turned upside down. All of a sudden I wasn't doing a children's book for Ruby parents anymore. I was doing a 15 or like a hundred or a thousand books for Ruby parents. I was doing uh, 15,000 books for non-developer parents who wanted to teach their kids about or change the way their kids feel about technology and change the, their attitudes towards technology. And I started needed to start from the very beginning. So I started to organize play testing sessions with kids and we started to figure out what do kids enjoy about computers? What is exciting about technology for them? And one of the sort of basic premises I started with was the idea that if Ruby or JavaScript or Python are the, the lingua franca of the future, we need more poetry classes, not grammar lessons. Because it's really funny the way we teach programming for, for beginners at this point. It, it's almost like we would teach pro, uh, people to speak French only by asking them to conjugate French irregular verbs and say like, there, go ahead, and do this. Instead, the way you learn foreign languages is by using them. You learn by writing your own poetry poems, really crappy at the beginning, then better at, over time. You write essays, you write opinion pieces, you read different things, you read contemporary stuff, you read classics, and you learn to have a vocabulary and you learn different ways of expressing yourself. And I figured that there's something about the way we learn natural languages that should apply, or, or there at least be, should be like an opportunity to learn programming through these ways. And 
I figured that I need some sort of principles to guide my product development. Like, here I am, I have all these people waiting for a book, and I need some sort of principles to guide me. And I came up with three principles that I'm kind of going to use uh, as, as the uh, red line of, of this whole talk. Those are the principles of playfulness, curiosity, and rules. And all of the exercises I'm showing here are also available on helloruby.com. So you can go there, helloruby.com slash play. Uh, you can find, you can print out your first computers uh, and you can see what other kids have done with the exercises. Here's a Danish little girl who password protected her door with a computer. So kids nowadays, <laughs> really funny. So when I was studying in school, I thought that the world is very binary that there's this group of people who are logical, mathematical, introverted, and there's this group of people who are creative, colorful, artsy, and extroverted, and that there's no overlap between these people. And I like totally wanted to be on this side of the group, like the people who, who wanted to change the world. And I ended up studying social sciences and French and philosophy and arts and crafts. And it took me a long time to realize that no, like actually there is no binary world. We can be multiple things and we as people contain multitudes. And it totally makes sense uh, for, for like people to do different things. And Actually, for me, who loved Bernard Russell, who loved studying philosophy uh, and, and like formal logic, who loved conjugating the French verbs, I actually really enjoyed French grammar, uh, who enjoyed making socks, so following like step-by-step um, -step symbolic instructions uh, to complete uh, a sock, it totally made sense to enjoy programming and like it. And the only difference was that as a little girl, I thought that I was supposed to not like computers. And the thing that the kids today have, the modern little girls, is that they don't know that they're not supposed to like computers. They don't know it yet, and that's the biggest asset they have. Because they can be curious about computers. They are really precise, they concentrate well, uh, they are really good at coming up, coming up with imaginary worlds, and, and they don't know that they are not supposed to like computers. The only thing we as adults would need to do is figure out a curriculum that suits them. And that's the mission I set out to do. So I listed different sort of basic components of programming that you should master even before you write your first Ruby array or, or learn anything about, I don't know, like hashes or stuff like that. These are the things that kids uh, can learn already before the age seven when you abstract them correctly. So for instance, algorithms are just like cupcake recipes. You follow a step-by-step -step instruction. You need to be very exact in what kind of commands you give. Uh, if you abstract properly the cupcake recipe, you can pretty easily make different kinds of cupcakes. If you swap the blueberries to the bananas, you'll have different kinds of cupcakes. And if you swap, uh, like do different amounts of cupcakes or different amounts of quantities for the cupcakes, you'll have a different amount of uh, cupcakes in the end. And repetition, or the concept of a loop, is re actually really easily explained through dancing. So here's uh, some favorite dance moves of Ruby, the snow leopard, and the penguin. So Ruby loves this. And the loop she's going to do is, first she's going to do that five times. Then she's going to do that uh, while uh, the parent is holding their nose. And then the final round is going to be uh, doing the loop un uh, while until and uh, yeah, uh, and repeat until the parent claps their hands together. And that's as much as you need to know as a kid about a loop. There's something that starts the loop, something that ends the loop, and something that gets repeated in between. Or the idea of decomposition, of, of like decomposing a problem into smaller pieces, can be done with flow charts. It's almost like a spy exercise where all, like all sorts of misfortunes happen to Ruby's friends and you can follow with the flow chart where it went wrong. And, and this is where the kids can recognize what an infinite loop looks like. Ruby never gets, <laughs> gets to, either she stays hungry or, or she, she stays full and, and there's some wrong ordering in the sequences and, and the Android forgets to, to stop the water from running. Nothing more complicated than that. And I think this boils down to the idea that there's two types of joys in programming. There's the more intellectual pleasure of abstracting something beautifully, of like solving a really hard problem in, in a beautiful manner. And then there's the more or almost like physical joy of getting the computer to obey your will. And at least every time I get the computer to do what I want it to do, I feel like, yes, I'm the top of the world. And sort of tinkering and not really knowing what you're doing, but tinkering and twisting and toying around with the computer until it works the way you want it to work. And I think the latter is called play. And play was what I was after.
in order to understand what play was, I needed to go to the people who were best at play. And I figured that if there's someone who's really good at play, it must be Sesame Street, because Sesame Street is amazing. They've cranked out content for 30, 43 years, every single week, having educational fun content for kids. And they actually A-B test all of their content before there was even a name for A-B testing. They had like little groups of kids in front of uh, TVs, and they showed different kinds of content already in the 70s. And they had researchers on board thinking about this. And turns out, that Sesame Street thinks that play is paramount to our cognitive, social, physical, and emotional well-being. And then I went to another toy company who might be even more familiar for many of you, namely Lego. And Lego says there's five types of play. There's physical play, there's play with objects, there's symbolic play, there's pretense and social dramatic play, and then there's games with rules. And for some reason, we adults, we think of play as games with rules in this era. And they go, they go even further and they say that there's three types of motivations for a play. There's achievement-based motivation, there's social-based motivation, there's immersion-based motivation. But for some reason, whenever we're teaching programming or whenever we're teaching actually anything in life, we only use this side of play. You see like the progress, power, accumulation, numbers, optimization, analysis, challenging others, provocation, domination. And in reality, everyone who's ever programmed or at least programmed in an open source community knows that there's so much more to it. There's collaboration, there's self-disclosure, there's finding and giving support, uh, there's uh, roles, there's exploration, finding hidden things, there's uh, sometimes escape from real life and avoiding real life problems. All of these things exist, but only we use one uh, thing to teach programming. So I figured that, okay, these are the ways I, like, I want to use all of the aspects of play in, in what I'm doing. And many of you have different kinds of customers. So at this point I knew already, okay, like these are the things that I want to teach. These are the curriculum points. This is the way that I want to teach things. These are like the, the principles of play I have. And these are the people who I want to be teaching these things with too. And you all have different kinds of customers. Uh, I, for instance, I, I have the paying customers, those are the parents, and then I have the users, those are the kids. And sometimes these two groups don't really get along well because there's this thing called poop factor in, in kids, <laughs> kids' development. You can't have too many poop jokes in, in, in your content, otherwise the parents get annoyed. And then if you don't make the content like fun and engaging, the kids get annoyed. So there's balancing this side of things. But then there's also the production and product development side of things where the parent is actually a big nuisance. So I was in Japan doing some play testing over there and first I gave like a little lecture for the parents and explained to them like this Nordic way of thinking about play and open to, like exploring and, and making mistakes and trying out new things. And then we would do the play testing session and the parents would be like, you know this. <laughs> Let me show you how to do this. And I'm like, no, no, stay away. Like, don't come. I need to learn from the kids what is hard and what is easy. So we made a plan. We created a user experience journey map that we gave to the parents that asked them to make observations about their child. And this data was, it was really useful, but most of all, it was good to keep the parents away from distracting the, the product development process. So I don't know what, what the, like the, the tangible thing for you for your own work is, but probably everyone has those two types of customers. So the principles were playfulness, rules, and curiosity. And we're going to start with the principle number one, the playfulness principle, that question, what if? Asking always the question, what if? And, you know, when you talk to normal people or layman people who are not programmers, they think programming is very silent. The programmer, they sit in front of the computer and something happens and you never know if there's a breakthrough or not. Like in sports, you see that someone won. When a programmer cracks a really hardcore algorithm, they like might send an emoji, but that's about it. So for a normal person, like the culture and compassion and colorfulness that does exist in programming is super well hidden in like these murky underground internet forums like Stack Overflow and, and places like GitHub repositories and so forth, but normal people don't see it. And I set out on a mission to bring out those trolls and those like, uh, all, all of the colorfulness that exists in the programming community. And that happens through characters. And, and this is Ruby, she's, she's six years old and she's completely fearless, a little bit bossy. Uh, she's my, probably at this point, my best friend. And, 
And then when I tell Ruby in the morning that, Ruby, you need to dress up for school really fast, we're late. She will dress up for school, but she will leave her pajamas on because I didn't tell her to take the pajamas off explicitly. And, and when I tell Ruby that, oh, your room is such a mess, like clean up all the toys, they are everywhere. She will clean up the toys, but she will leave the pens and papers on the floor because pens and papers are really not toys. And these are all things that my six-year-old goddaughter, who is, who is like the person I mostly test this content with, like her mother is going to kill me because she has become this obnoxious little six-year-old who, who counter, <laughs> counter uh, arguments, everything. But she learns something very fundamental about computer science, that you need to give right orders in the right sequence. You need to be very exact in naming things, um, and so on and so on. And little Ruby, she also has different kinds of rules for how she dresses up. So, for instance, on Mondays, she wears only clothes that are red and green. And on Fridays, she wears clothes that are not yellow. And this way, you can teach Boolean algebra that otherwise wouldn't come for the kid until late, late, late in their lives, already for like a six-year-old, easily and in a fun way. But most importantly, the kids learn to understand that mostly big problems are just small problems stuck together and that computers are not magic and, and they are not black boxes that someone else owns, but you can actually break apart problems and learn uh, to get through them. So the second principle is the principle of logic. It's always asking the question, how? It's imposing a logic on something otherwise hard to understand. And this is one of my favorite things uh, in the world. One of the things that makes me really sad was the, the little girl I was who thought that there is this binary world of the people who get to create stuff and then there's the people who just consume them. And for me, Every time I hear someone say, oh, like, that's, that's magic, that's a black box, that's engineering work, I get really disappointed and sad because technology is meant to be tinkered with. Technology is meant to be taken apart and twisted and we shouldn't think that everything is ready in the world. Everything is not ready in the world. And that's why we teach kids how to see imposed logic on something that otherwise would seem just like a, like a thing that has always been there. So one of the exercises I do with kids is, is I give them this little um, sticker that has an on-off button to them, uh, to it, and I tell them that adults, they have this thing called Internet of Things. But then this afternoon, you guys have a special skill. You can make anything in this room into a computer if you just decide to do so. And here's, for instance, a bicycle lamp that one little boy made into a computer. And when I asked him what the computer does, he said that it, it projects movies as well as acts as a bicycle lamp. And, and here's a couple of candles that you can automatically uh, press to flick on and off. And here's a book that automatically like changes pages. And this is a really stupid and silly exercise, but it helps the kids to see the world and have the imagination to see the world as something that they can, they can alter and, and change. And it actually is really useful for adults too. They also have this little uh, cheat that they do where they can think about like different, different sensors like orientation and temperature and vibration and moisture and, and the internet and draw a picture of themselves using their new computers. Another exercise we do with kids is they get like a keyboard and the first thing they do is, and, and a sticker sheet, and they put the stickers on the computer and then uh, they write the numbers over there. Try explaining to a six-year-old why computer numbers go like one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 nine, zero. It's, it's a really complicated mathematical thing to explain. Uh, then they get to design their own buttons. I'll get to that later on. Uh, they get to type their own name with a keyboard. The kids nowadays, like they don't, they see a keyboard is the first thing they see of alphabets, not the A, B, C, D, E, F, G thing. And then they get to plug their keyboard to their parent and see if it actually works. So the parent holds the keyboard and the other, uh, or the end of the, the power cord and the kid holds the keyboard and they try pressing the different animals and, and see what happens when I press the gorilla button. Will the parent do this or so? And it's, the kids can do this for hours, and the, the buttons work also for your own computer, so it's, it's a fun thing. The third principle is the principle of curiosity. Always asking questions why. It's having an open mind about exploration, it's about finding hidden things, and it's about imagination. One of the things that really, really kills me is that computers 
used to be the, the children of, of poetry and mathematics. Uh, the first computer programmer in the world was the, the daughter of uh, the poet Lord Byron and the mathematician mother Ada Lovelace, who was the first person in the world to actually understand that computers were not fancy calculators, but actually that computers could calculate values that represented different kinds of things, and that made a computer into anything. And for some reason, we've forgotten about this beautiful past of computers. And when I show people pictures that, or when I tell people that, like, I think the kids should understand what the John von Neumann model is, like, they're like, are you serious about this? But think about it. If you abstract computer into the idea that a computer is always something that data goes in, something happens, and something else comes out. And in effect, everything in computing is that when you press like on Facebook, there's an instruction that says that add one more like. There's data that goes in, uh, an instruction tells to add one more like to the Facebook page, and up comes two likes or whatever. And this is the beauty of computers, that there is data, there is the processor, and most importantly, there's the memory. And there's the two types of memory. The memory that remembers the data and what happens to it, and the memory that gives the instructions of what to do. And that is the thing that makes computers so special, because a pinboard machine, pinball machine is always a pinball machine, a tractor is always a tractor, but a computer can be anything, depending on what kind of software you write for it. And the way we teach this to kids is by physical activities. Uh, we've built this like little uh, cardboard computer. This is for toddlers. Uh, they crawl inside of the computer and there's a little card that shows them a picture of what they should do when they come out. For instance, like hop on one feet or come out backwards or, or so. And then the other kids need to guess what the, the code was like. And they learn about the principle of input, output, CPUs and memory through play. And I can tell you that the cardboard box, like it, it breaks up every single time we do this. It, it gets to be so much fun. I also do exercises where we talk about what computers are because the scary thing is that six to seven year or five to seven year olds can be very, very conservative. Uh, when I ask kids, is this a computer? For instance, I show them a picture of like a car, um, a grocery store, a dog and a toilet and I ask them, which one of these is a computer? The kids unanimously say, none of this is a computer. <laughs> like almost judgmental, like what are you talking about? None of this is a computer. And I ask them, what is a computer? And they say, like, oh, that's the thing that like, mom and dad spend too much time on. Like, they don't even realize that iPads are computers or mobile phones are computers. But then we get to talk. And we talk that actually a car is a computer, and even five-year-olds know pretty well what a navigation system is. And, and then we talk that, hmm, like maybe in grocery stores there's all kinds of computers, like the computer that keeps the ice cream uh, cold and the computer that is used when you pay your, pay your groceries. And, and you know what, like when your parents were your age, computers were so big that they couldn't fit on this, like this whole stage. But when you grow up to be adults, computers are going to be so tiny that they fit, fit into every single milk bottle in the store. And that's when the kids get to be really excited, like, hmm, what would happen if a milk bottle had a computer inside of it? And we talk about dogs and how dogs are not computers, obviously, duh, what I was saying, but maybe a, like a dog's collarbone might have a computer inside of it, or maybe in the future, like a dog will have a microchip inside of it, and then we get into really interesting discussions of what is an animal and what is a machine and what takes them apart, like five-year-olds are so smart. And then I tell them that in Japan, toilets are computers and that they get hacked, and this is always like the best thing six-year-olds ever know. <laughs> I think one of the things that we do nowadays is, is in school, at least in Finland, we teach kids so many things. We teach them how they can become astronauts and we teach them how a combustion engine works and we teach them about the global like, climate change and all these complicated things. But when our kids, especially the kids of non-programmers, come to their parents and ask, what is a bubble sorting algorithm? Or, uh, Linda, what happens when I press YouTube, like the play button on YouTube? Like, what happens, who talks to who, and how does the computer know, like, how the video shows up? Or, Linda, is internet a place? We, we adults, we become very silent. We mutter something about it being very complicated or very magical. Well, it's, it's neither. It's not complicated and it's not magical. It just happened really, really, really fast. Computer scientists are among the biggest idols I have. I, we don't have a like, flag day for Lino Sturwalds in Finland. I think we should. I think he's the biggest like, export hero we have. The guy who came up with Linux and Git, well, like, oh, we don't recognize him at all as a society. But 
now I've lost photo of my <laughs> so um, yeah, so they've, they've built up abstraction levels on top of each other until we have, as adults, no idea what powers our computers. And you are a different crowd from him, but here, but like normal people, they don't have any idea how their computers work. They have like more powerful computers in their like uh, pockets than, than the one the mankind went to moon with, but they still play like angry birds with this, which is such a shame. So what we do with kids is we start by the very basics and we uh, build a paper computer and we look at the professor, uh, professor processor who's really good at bossing other people around and we look at the helpful RAM and ROM and we look where your summer vacation photos or your game levels get to change, uh, save, that's the hard drive and we look at like what kind of operating systems you can choose to your computers. Kids are, like I thought that they would choose like the cute penguin or the omnipresent windows, they always choose the apple, it's like <laughs> magic. And uh, they get to design their own computers. Here's a few examples of the computers kids would design. Uh, one of the things they get to do, they get to design their own buttons and sometimes they design buttons to order ice cream or send a teacher to Saturn or <laughs> the boy actually he made a button to like send the teacher back from Saturn so <laughs> everything ended up okay and one of my favorite stories is this little boy called Arthur who designed first he was very proud about his paper computer and he designed a button uh, to print out Lego coloring pages because his mom had printed him out Lego coloring pages before and he was very proud about them but Pretty soon he was like bored and felt that coloring pages are not very exciting. So he decided to print out real Legos. And then he went completely wild and printed out with his paper computer, uh, a toothbrush, uh, a TV, and then breakfast for the entire family the next morning. And Arthur's mom, who's one of my best friends and very tech savvy, she was like, Arthur, you know, that's not possible. But the whole point is that is possible. Arthur is going to grow up into a world where he's probably going to 3D print his like candies on Saturday mornings. And he's going to 3D print his Legos. That's not even the wildest thing out there. So it's good that we prepare him for that future. Uh, one of my other favorite stories is of little Ada. Uh, she's six year old and she wasn't very sure about this computer business in the beginning. She was like, mm, computer is not really my thing. And we got to talk with her and I asked her, what do you want to do when you grow up? And Ada says with a six-year-old's determination that I want to be a dolphin doctor. <laughs> a dolphin doctor. And dolphin doctors don't need computers. But then we started to talk about it and, and eventually she ended up designing a dolphin health application for her patients that had little pictures of the dolphins and like their health stats and, and all this like metadata. And, and she was an amazing UX designer and, and had such like an empathic view towards the dolphins. And I really hope that she becomes a programmer when she grows up. But Probably my favorite story of all time is of this little boy whose favorite thing in the world was to be an astronaut. And the little boy, uh, he plays this with his father. He has these huge headphones on and he sits on the opposite side of the room with his paper compu computer absolutely totally immersed into the intergalactic planetary navigation application that he has built. Because the father is the lone astronaut, he's on the other side of the room, but in reality he's in another galaxy in the Martian atmosphere. And the little boy's sole responsibility is to bring the father back safely to Earth. And these kids are going to have a profoundly different experience of technology. They are going to think in a very different manner of what technology is, should be, uh, should feel like. And they're going to see coding as a tool of creation, much like Lego blocks or, or crayons, not as something esoteric and, and belonging to a whole different group of people. The ending is probably something like this. There's nothing new in what I was talking about. The whole history of computers is full of luminary people who, who have been talking about this stuff. Already Alan Turing in, in, the, in the 50s, he talked about the child machine, the idea that instead of artificial intelligence being done the way it is today, what if we like, taught the computers to taught themselves? What if we modeled the, the computers after the way kids learn about stuff? And then Seymour Puppert and Cynthia Solomon in the 70s wrote this wonderful research paper. If you haven't read it, please do. 20 things to do with a computer where they uh, underline the idea that computer education should be about practice, uh, producing practical things, about uh, doing something real in the world instead of calculating the 21st prime uh, root squares of like 21st prime numbers or so. And then finally, there's Alan Kay, who in the 70s, and, and 
this is an amazing article, Personal Computer for Children of All Ages. He basically imagines like a hackable iPad and he has pictures and everything. That's an amazing article that really outlines the creativity that computers have. And so storytelling, that's not new either. There's a bunch of people who've done this before in amazing ways. There's Ruby Wizardry by Eric Weinstein, there's Computational Fairy Tales, there's Lauren Ipsum, and there's Wise Poignant Guide to Ruby, which was, by the way, the book that brought me into the Ruby community. I most definitely didn't learn anything about programming from that book, but it showed me into this world where wit and wizardry and, and whimsicality was kind of appreciated and showed me to this warm community of people, and I felt that I could belong to this community as well. And that's why we need the storytellers. We need the people to bridge the gap between the machines and the men. And when you talk with normal people, again, like I, I feel really weird saying the word normal people, but when you pe talk with like laymen, uh, it's funny when they think that, that I don't know, that, that computers write code and that programming languages are written by computers. And they don't realize that, no, like, people write code, and a code is, code is a language for people to talk to one another, and only secondarily for the com a com a computer to execute. And that programming languages are designed by people, for other people to understand that the whole DNA of technology is humanity. And in fact, in the past, a computer used to be a person who's really good at calculating things. And the Greek, it always goes back to the Greek, uh, they, they thought the technology, it's not only the tools, but also the techniques and skills and competencies alongside the tools that make it possible possible to do something better and fast. So agriculture is technology, democracy is technology. And somehow we lost all of this. We all have childhood stories that have shaped the way we grow up as adults and human beings. Uh, they stay with us for years to come. We read them as little kids and, and then as adults we don't even remember how much they influence the way we see the world. And when I was a small kid, I wanted to be a world builder when I grow up. So I would wake up in the morning in Moomin Valley, and that's how I learned about family values. And in the afternoons, I would roam around Tatooine being the fearless Jedi Knight, Sabe Sunrider. And that's how I learned about what's right and wrong. And in the evenings, I would go to sleep in Narnia. I don't know what I learned about Narnia. <laughs> Something probably. Anyways, you don't even... Sometimes you can't even pinpoint the things that you learn from stories, but they stay with you and they influence your taste for years to come. Uh, the sad thing is that you can't really graduate to become a world maker. Like, there's no university degree that allows you to, to do that for a living, except the one that does. The one exception and the one loophole, and that is you. That is the programmers of the world. Imagine that you guys get to do that every single day. You get to create an entire universe with the pure power of your own words. You get to design all of the rules, all of the vocabularies, all of the, everything that happens in that world. And that power is yours. Thank you so much. Now I have zero idea how fast I was. <laughs> I think we have time for a couple of questions. I, I suspect it's so. <laughs> now if no one like gets me out of the pickle of speaking too fast, I'm just going to be sad and cry here <laughs> for the rest of the day. Please, one question. <laughs> yes. You forget about a Friday hug. Ah, <laughs> I don't want to spoil it. I, so Juanito, the thing, he said that he's seen me speak this, like give this talk seven times. <laughs> so I need to <laughs> do something different. So this was the reason why I did something different this time. Uh, no Friday hug. Yeah, I think someone else is going to do still the Friday hug. <laughs> so I won't steal the show for now. But that's one example of like when I show people pictures of the Ruby Friday hugs, they're like, are these programmers? I thought that programmers sit alone in like cubicles and never talk to other people. I'm like, nope. <laughs> this happens. It's a are very... there any other questions for Linda? Or do we want to hear a joke? <laughs> I can repeat the question too. Um, so, if I wanted to start teaching like six-year-olds, uh, it's it's something that's very hard to get into. Like, you need to have some teaching degree. Mm -hmm. How do you how are you able to get involved with teaching young kids? 
So I think one of the cool things about the Ruby community is that there's shoes, there's hackety hack, there's a lot of like tools available for a parent who already is a programmer who can sort of like pace out the curriculum in a way that makes sense for his or her like own kid and that's a big plus. In addition, uh, for the parents who are not that technical, there's code.org which is really good. It, it's this uh, US nonprofit that uh, like breaks breaks the whole like coding curriculum into sequences of like small steps where you have like a scratch like environment and it's gamified and it's very much like points and power and progress, but it's really excellent for kids who are motivated by that stuff. And then there's Scratch, which is like, can be very, when, sometimes when I sit with kids down and, and try to like engage them with Scratch, they need more instructions in the beginning to get going, then when they get going, they are like absolutely like on fire and way better programmers than I will ever be <laughs> after uh, two hours of work. So it really depends on what kind of a kid you have and what they sort of find exciting or, or yeah, uh, meaningful. There's also something called Hopscotch that is an iPad application, much like Scratch. Um, what else? KidsRuby.com, which has a lot of like Ruby content. But many of those things are very unapproachable for a parent who isn't a programmer themselves. So I think we have it good, but then the rest of the population is kind of lost. Just, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for trying to change kids' minds. I, myself, I work with kids a lot, uh, related, sport related, and I love working with them. So I value a lot <laughs> your work. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, I guess you've played around with many, many kids for now. Uh, do you feel that uh, technology is somehow taking over these uh, role play games that you take mm. to schools? And it's an interesting question. I think not all screen time is equal. Like you can do really horrible and passive things on iPads if you use them as a babysitter for a kid, like just watching videos and so forth. But like all of us know, like my parents had no idea what I was doing on the computer when I was 13 year old. And I was doing really awesome things and like building actual worlds and, and making cool things and websites and stuff like that. And like we all know that computers are not sort of passive and bad things for people. So I, I think it's the same with tablets and, and stuff like that, that there's always like two sides. Um, that being said, there was a reason why I chose to, like the book is an actual physical book, uh, which has been like a nightmare to produce because I come from like the web industry where you deploy five times a day. The publishing industry is like, we can't do anything under a year, sorry. <laughs> Which is like, okay. <laughs> That's gonna, but the idea is that you would have a parent and a kid read together a physical book. And kids before the age seven, they learn so much about the world other than computers and computing. They will have like the rest of their lives to learn about sitting in front of a screen and interacting with a screen. But if you learn about the concepts already at a younger age, maybe it will make it easier for you to learn stuff at an older age. And I suppose like, I'm kind of interested and curious to see what the mobile experience for, say, Hello Ruby would look like, but I don't think anyone, not even Sesame Street or, or those guys have nailed yet what like actually playing on a tablet looks like or what actual digital toys look like instead of just games or, or like uh, books that are electronic. So I think there is, so anyone who wants to work on this problem is, is like probably gonna face some really exciting challenges. And please do. One more, yes. <laughs> Uh, hi, Linda. Uh, hi. I would like to ask one question. Like, what is the greatest challenge in uh, teaching children programming? Um, probably deciding what kind of kids they are. Because like, kids can be so... I, like, my group of kids I, I've worked with, and there's been like, a bunch of different groups, uh, has been around five to seven year olds. And between that age group, like, kids can be so different from their, like, their cognitive, their emotional skills, their physical skills, their like, social skills. Uh, deciding what is the right level for a kid and not trying to push things down their throat. Uh, the one thing I really like hate, like the one thing that I feel really fearful about doing is like ruining some poor kid's life for good. Because when I was in, in so my, my programming career actually starts when I was 13 years old and I was making websites and I was like having these mad teenage girl crushes on different people <laughs> and building like websites in honor of them. Not creepy at all. And uh, then I went to like AP um, programming class and the first thing we learned was Java. 
And the thing that we were supposed to do was like to draw uh, a picture of a cat with Java. And I felt it was a ridiculous exercise because I was so much better at drawing with my bare hands uh, a cat or I could draw, draw like a really awesome cat with Photoshop, but like with the mathematical coordinations like didn't make any sense. And the thing that the teacher forgot to mention is that if you want to make one cat, it's okay to do it by hand or with Photoshop. But if you want to make a thousand cats or if you want to make all the cats from the, like the colors of the rainbow or like different sized cats, it's really good to sort of abstract it and modularize it and make it into a program code that like draws that cut in for you. And that connection ruined programming for me for like 10 years or so because I felt that programming is this stupid nerdy thing that like is about like putting dots on like <laughs> a drawing board and, and I'm so much better off with Photoshop and, and drawing by hand. So probably like answer to your question is figuring out what kind of a kid the kid is and giving the right context for the kid for the learning stuff so that it doesn't become like a boring Oh, like, oh no, I need to do the programming exercises today. Yuck. <laughs> so you're saying that uh, we should teach them programming like outside of computers, is it? Maybe, if, if that suits the kids. Some kids really like excel with actual physical computers because you, you know, it, like, computer is like one of the best work companions I have because it always tells you whether you did right or wrong. Like everything else in Word is so, well, there's so much murkier and sort of in between, but computer always tells you what is right or wrong. So for some kids that definitely helps and works. I suppose, I, I, yeah, context for the kid and then like understanding what kind of a kid they are when you're teaching them. Empathy. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.